So before we get, I want to make a quick announcement. So uh, somebody had a good idea of uh, uh, a suggestion to have posters that have already been displayed in a poster session displayed still for people to view them if they didn't get a chance to look at them. So if you have a poster, you've already gone to the poster session, feel free to put it up. Uh, you can put it up around wherever you can sneak it into the, in the lecture room, but then there's next to the coffee, uh, where we have coffee break, there's a atrium to the right of it. If you can put that up with push pins, and if not, I haven't checked it out to get uh, scotch tape for you. Guess what? My, one of my students now I know who gets scotch tape so he can put it up this way. You know, and you can keep it out there for like a day, maybe. Uh, people are interested. And then next group of people can put those up. There's a, a, a Okay, so for the next uh, remaining two weeks, you can you can still display your poster even after the book, if you would interested. Okay, uh, let's get started. So uh, it's a pleasure to have Alex uh, Kubica from Amazon, uh, transferring from Amazon, uh, who will be telling us about uh, topological and quantum LBPC codes. And hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the organizers for putting together uh, this great event and for inviting me so that I have a chance to talk to you. Um, so the, so uh, the topic of my series of lectures is uh, from topological to quantum LDPC codes. Um, I know that this audience is very broad, so uh, some bits will be very trivial to some of you. Uh, some bits um, may be unknown or unfamiliar to some of you, so uh, probably I, I will bore everyone or I, or I will lose everyone at some point. So, uh, so please um, forgive me for that. Um, so in my uh, lectures, I will uh, look at, at the problems from the quantum error correction perspective, uh, thinking more about uh, how to uh, run the coding algorithm, how to implement gates. So this may be a new take uh, on those uh, problems for uh, some of you, because maybe you are thinking about um, quantum error correcting codes from a more um, quantum many body uh, uh, systems perspective. So uh, I hope that, you know, although we will be talking about you know, tutorial code, I will not bore you to death. So, um, yes, yeah, so um, I split my lecture into three parts. And in the first part, I will talk about um, uh, topological codes. And uh, here we will be um, revisiting, but not for too long, the toric code. And uh, we will mostly focus on the problem of uh, decoding. Uh, what are the decoding algorithms? How to correct errors? In the second part, and uh, we will discuss limitations on uh, topological codes. And here we will be thinking about, um, you know, uh, how, what's the best performance we can have uh, from the code? What are the gates that we can do with the code? Or what are the code parameters uh, that we can get? And uh, this will be done in the context of topological. Uh, codes. And in the third part, um, you know, motivated by the uh, previous parts, uh, we will um, leave the known realm of the Tori code and we will start uh, thinking about uh, more general constructions, uh, namely uh, quantum LDPC codes. So here I will um, not give you um, a thorough. Um, review of those uh, quantum LDPC codes because those constructions and those uh, recent breakthrough constructions get uh, quite uh, complex but I will give you some um, some um, some idea uh, some tools to uh, read more and catch up with uh, recent breakthroughs and here I would also if time 
permits, I would like to talk about a single shot quantum error correction. Okay, so um, let's get started. So uh, in my lectures, I will be uh, focusing on stabilizer codes. So uh, Victor uh, introduced uh, stabilizer formalism to you, um, but let me tell you um, just a quick uh, brief recap to uh, what stabilizers code, uh, codes are. And um, but maybe, you know, let's take one step back. Um, it was an interesting question during lunch yesterday. Uh, we were asking about what is a code? Okay, so, so what is a code really? So, so first we have some, uh, some qubit, or actually we take some number of qubits. We have n qubits and uh, we have, you know, a Hilbert space associated with it. So um, this is our physical system. And um, if we have a physical system, what is a code? A code would be some uh, subspace of, of this Hilbert space. So if we want a code that encodes one, uh, one qubit, you know, this, this better be a two-dimensional subspace. Uh, and if we want uh, k, um, k uh, qubits encoded, uh, this, this, uh, this, this has to be uh, isomorphic to C uh, to uh, tensor uh, k. So it, it's just a subspace of the Hilbert space. Uh, but um, a code needs to be practical. So um, this, is, uh, this is not enough. We cannot work with it. Um, and what's the, what's the problem? Well, uh, even to specify this uh, code space may, may be problematic, right? In order to specify some, uh, some subspace, uh, I may provide to you um, a basis that span the subspace. But uh, each, uh, in order to specify a, a vector in n-dimensional uh, uh, in n-dimensional Hilbert space, um, or uh, two to the n-dimensional Hilbert space, uh, I would need to give you exponentially many bits so that even to specify it may be difficult, right? And that's where uh, stabilizer codes uh, come into play and shine because uh, this uh, subspace is specified as plus one eigenspace of uh, stabilizer operators. So uh, the stabilizer uh, code is defined as uh, a subspace spanned by uh, eig plus one eigenvectors of uh, stabilizer operators. So those are um, some poly operators and uh, we require that those are plus one eigenspace. So this is, uh, this is all known. Um, so what, what else uh, do we need? Um, is, that, is that it? Um, well, um, in order for the code to be useful, in order for the code uh, to, um, to serve some purpose, for instance, in communication, uh, we, we want uh, you know, to encode our information. Then we want to apply some noise. And then we want to uh, apply some recovery. Uh, right, and we want uh, this map to be uh, appro approximately uh, the identity map on the uh, encoded uh, information. So uh, the other thing that we need to uh, worry about and think of is uh, how do we find, how do we implement this recovery operation? Uh, because oftentimes, you know, you check, for instance, uh, a Neil Laflamme condition, you know that a recovery operator exists. But then, you know, what is it? How do we uh, realize it? We need to, uh, we need to have that uh, specified uh, we, uh, in order, uh, in order uh, for, for the code to be useful. And uh, the last thing, uh, so because this, this setting is, for instance, very good in communication, right? We, uh, we encode our information that we want to send into some code, then we send it through some channel. Uh, think of, you know, sending out photons in, in space. You know, they, they can get lost. And then uh, on the other end, there's a receiver and you know, they, they undo the damage um, the noise did uh, over this uh, transmission channel. Uh, but uh, if we want to build quantum computers, uh, this setting is somewhat uh, restrictive and this is not uh, the setting that we want to think of. We're not just sending uh, information, we want to compute on it. So uh, what is important from the perspective of uh, fault tolerant quantum computation is how to do gates. And gates, by gates here, I mean um, some, um, 
unitary operations on the encoded qubits. So um, this ties to the structure of my talk uh, because when we talk about the recovery operation, this is uh, basically the uh, emphasis of the first part when we, when we talk about decoding algorithms, how we do this recovery efficiently. Uh, and um, when, uh, when we talk about uh, gates, uh, fault tolerant gates, this ties to the limitations on topological codes. Are there any questions? Just, just to be clear, is the is the choice of plus one or any let's say in this in this four code case any configuration of charges that are so from the right from the uh, quantum error correction perspective it's arbitrary you can pick any plus minus uh, uh, subspace uh, but um, when you pick plus one uh, subspace you know you can think about you know a, a, a Hamiltonian and the ground state of the Hamiltonian. Everything's ideal, but not everything That's right. Ideal. That's right. Yes. So uh, I uh, work with uh, stabilizer codes. So um, all my uh, physical constituents are two-level systems, qubits. I have n of them, so everything is uh, finite dimensional here. I may take, you know, uh, a limit of n going to infinity. Uh, and uh, I talk about stabilizer codes, meaning those operators are uh, Pauli operators. Uh, that's right, that's right. And for, uh, for topological codes, we need this extra structure uh, and uh, I, I'll, I'll cover that in a second, yes? Um, so uh, you a priori you don't have any scaling. You know I, I tell you that this is a code that works for n uh, qubits. That's right. So then I need to define a code family. So uh, what you guys are very familiar with is those topological codes where you have some lattice, and you know the code is naturally defined on a lattice. You just take bigger and bigger lattices, and that's how you scale up n. But in um, but for general codes, this this you know, you cannot relate a code on n qubits to a code on n plus one qubits or uh, two n qubits. Uh, so another way to scale up and consider a, a limit of n going to infinity is co code concatenation, that we use one code. Uh, so basically, you know, imagine you have a qubit, then you encode it into, say, I don't know, five qubits, right? This is, this is uh, the five qubit code or, or whatever code. It doesn't have to be five five qubits, but you encode uh, some number of logical qubits, say you know, one, one logical qubit into uh, n qubits. Okay, so this is the first level of concatenation. And now you can think of, okay, but those qubits, they should not be physical qubits. Again, they should be encoded into uh, the same code. And uh, you repeat this process, you know, uh, n times. And then you, you see that you will, the number of uh, qubits used will be, you know, uh, n to the power of a uh, capital N. And that's how you can consider a system, uh, you know, uh, some, some, some limit of uh, larger and larger codes. Does this make sense? But, but the locality will be lost because, you know, you don't have um, local operators and stuff. But is this actually done or do you... And so those were the, the initial constructions when people proved the threshold theorem, uh, they use concatenated constructions. Because the alternative is just to repeat, have those be physical qubits in the first layer. Yes. And then just repeat, you know, just, it, it, just copy. No, no. Just copy that first coding many times. And yeah, and that's what we do, but it grows exponentially, right? You encode, uh, you don't think about this physical qubit as a physical qubit, it's a logical qubit in another layer. That's right. Yeah, but simpler way where you have locality you just repeat it you just have copies of this and so now you have uh, that's right but then uh, you don't protect this qubit more you just have more of those qubits more. yes 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 but then like if that's good enough protection um yeah yeah um, but um so but we want to uh, have um so when we talk about um so 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 um so maybe I'm, I'm confusing you guys. So uh, the question is, I have K 
qubits that I want to protect, and I want to protect them better and better. You know, I can use topological codes where this scaling is kind of natural or concatenation where you, I have to do that. Okay, so um, are there any other questions about uh, stabilizer codes? Okay, so uh, maybe some useful terminology. Uh, in the talk, I will be talk, uh, thinking about CSS stabilizer codes. Um, and what it means is that those uh, stabilizers, those commuting Pauli operators uh, can be uh, chosen to be X uh, or Z type. And the Tor code is an example of a CSS code because I have Z checks and X checks. I don't have checks that mix uh, X and Z. Um, and um, okay, so, uh, right. So uh, this, uh, this is uh, very nice and uh, we will see uh, uh, in the decoding in the later part of the talk, it, it simplifies the problem of decoding because every error, you know, think of Pauli errors, um, bit flips and phase flips. If I have a stabilizer code that has the CSS structure, uh, X type stabilizers may anti commit with some Z errors, and uh, Z stabilizers may anti commit with some X errors. So basically, the information about X errors is from Z stabilizers and uh, vice versa. So I the, this problem of decoding splits. I don't have to worry about uh, that. And this simplifies the discussion as we will see with the Tor code. Okay, so you know the Tor code, but you know, what would this lecture be if I didn't draw it and explain it? So um, I have the square lattice. Um, L by L uh, with uh, periodic boundary conditions. So it's on the torus. Uh, and now I place uh, qubits on edges of this, um, of this uh, lattice. And for every phase, I have a Z type a parity check. So ZF, uh, it acts on four qubits around this plaquette. And also for every vertex, I have a X type parity check. So this is phase F, this is vertex V. And you know, of course, you know that they commute um, because you know, if those guys are far apart, they commute trivially. If they intersect, uh, by definition, they will have even intersection, so they will commute. So indeed, this gives me the uh, stabilizer code, the, the famous toric code. And you guys know this model and from the perspective of a Hamiltonian, I can, I can think of um, a Hamiltonian that is a sum of all uh, plaquette terms and all uh, vertex terms and the ground space of this Hamiltonian will correspond to the um, code space. So, How many of uh, Z parity checks do I have? Well, how many? So there's a parity check for every phase. So there is uh, the number of uh, Z checks. Uh, Z checks is L squared. Same for the number of X checks. It's also L squared because there is L squared uh, vertices of this lattice. But now, um, notice that not all of them are independent. There is one relation between uh, Z checks and X checks. So the number of uh, independent, let me de de denote it with a prime, uh, the number of independent Z checks and X checks is L squared minus one. So now um, you know the formula that if I have a stabilizer code with N qubits, and I have some number of independent checks, then the number of logical qubits is N minus uh, the number of independent uh, stabilized generators. So 
you know, what is the number of qubits here? Is the number of edges, which is 2L squared. So, you know, plug the numbers and you get two. So this code encodes two logical uh, qubits. And you know uh, from condensed matter uh, uh, angle that, you know, this, the, the ground space of this Hamming Hamiltonian is uh, four for degenerate. So indeed, you know, we have two uh, logical qubits. What are the, any, uh, are there any other questions uh, on, on this thing? All clear? Um, oh yeah, so if I, so you, uh, so, so right, so Z check is associated with every face. So we have L uh, squared faces, uh, but not all the Z checks are independent. Basically, if you multiply all those L squared checks, I get the identity operator. So there is one redundant check. So how many independent uh, checks do I have? Well, it's going to be L squared minus one. And this minus one comes from the fact that there is one relation among those Z checks. And then, uh, so here I use this, this formula that in order to find out what um, the number of logical qubits is in the stabilizer code, uh, I need to take the number of physical qubits and subtract the number of um, independent party checks. And you should think of, uh, about it in the following way. I have my Hilbert space and um, each party check, you know, slices it in half. And, uh, you know, so uh, if I take log there, you know, I have uh, N minus R. Yes? Uh, that is a requirement that is you you've got to that's the definition of a stabilizer code and um, there's a generalization uh, and some of you uh, know well because you're working on subsystem codes where we don't require the parity checks to commute uh, and you know uh, recently it's quite popular you know this topic of flocate codes where 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 magic happens Uh, yeah, so so the relation that I, I was talking about is product of all faces uh, is the identity operator and product of all vertices is, uh, is the identity operator. Those are, you know, uh, this one comes from this and this one comes from that. Okay, so uh, we have two qubits, so we better have uh, two logical, uh, two uh, pairs of anti-commuting uh, logical Pauli operators. So as, as you, uh, as you uh, know, the logical operators in the Torah code form strings. So if I take a string like that and I apply ZZZ along this string, notice that it will trivially commute with uh, Z checks. And it will also commute with uh, X checks, right? Because if I have an X check here, the overlap is even. So um, this is a logical Z. And there will be a different logical Z along this non-contractable loop. You know, they correspond to a non-contractable loop here and a non-contractable loop there. So those would be Z checks, uh, Z uh, logical operators and loops in the dual lattice, if I take a string like that of x's, it will be a logical x2, and this guy would be logical x1. So this is x1, and this would be x2. Um, and um, how uh, can we think about implementing those um, those um, uh, logical operators, well, what we can imagine is, um, we can imagine starting in the, in the round space of this Hamiltonian, okay? And now uh, I implement a single Z, Z operator, this, um, moves me from the ground space. Now I'm in an excited space. And this excited space, uh, in the excited state, 
and, and uh, this the, the energy level uh, so so this is the ground space uh, it bumps me up by uh, basically uh, it's, it's due to the fact that you know now those x x uh, checks will not uh, commute so instead of giving me plus plus one eigenvalue they will give me minus one eigenvalue so the difference between um, the ground state and this um, excited state uh, would be uh, four units. So uh, this creates those two uh, excitations, uh, electric excitations. And now I can just uh, move them, uh, keep moving them. I will not pay any penalty. Uh, so if I apply uh, Z guy, now this guy pops here and so on and so on. And this is how you can think of uh, from the condensed matter perspective, what, uh, what it is uh, to have a logical uh, poly operator and uh, how to implement it. Well, uh, I just create a pair of two uh, excitations, two charges, and I drag them around some non-contractible loop and I annihilate them at the other end. And this implements a uh, logical Z. If I take a, magnetic, a pair of magnetic fluxes that are um, associated with violated Z uh, plaquettes, I can do the same thing. I can create a pair of them and I can drag them along, along a non-contractible loop. This will implement a logical uh, Pauli. In this case, it will implement a logical uh, X. Does this make sense? And uh, no, this is this is a great question. Uh, yes, so uh, why why do I call one logical uh, uh, Z1, the other one uh, Z2? Uh, how is this choice made? Well, it's an arbitrary choice. And this is a, a great question because when we talk about uh, logical operators, I always make some implicit choice of the basis of the, of the uh, logical basis, right? Because uh, I know that uh, what I could establish without choosing the basis, I could say that those operators preserve the code space, uh, but without having a basis, I couldn't call them, you know, Pauli X uh, or logical Hadamard and so on. So um, it's it's good. Maybe this is a, a good place to make this remark. If I have a stabilizer code, say a CSS stabilizer code, I can always uh, consider. So so let's say that I have a CSS stabilizer code. So I will have those um, X type parity checks and Z type parity checks. I can always consider, um, I can always consider a state uh, psi that is uh, that is a sum of uh, the following states, and I I need to take all possible X type stabilizers. Not only generators. I take all possible, um, all possible uh, products of stabilized generators, and uh, I act with them on the state that is uh, all zeros. This will always uh, give me a, a state in the code space. So maybe this is a little exercise, or maybe we can do it now. Uh, we can check that this guy is in the code space of my stabilizer code. How do I, how do I prove it? Well, um, it is in the uh, code space if it's a plus one eigen uh, vector. So um, notice that uh, if I have, um, so let's take a Z type stabilizer. I apply Z type stabilizer to this state. So, so what happens? I have this sum S, then there are X type stabilizers and all zeros. But by definition of the stabilizer code, uh, stabilizer operators commute with one another. So I can push this guy through X, no problem. And then Z type operator acts on the zero state. But uh, zero state is an eigenstate plus one eigenstate of S. So uh, it disappears. So I get back the 
uh, well, sorry, it not disappears. It it gives me the, the same state, state back. Uh, so I get the, uh, the initial state I started with. So uh, for Z type stabilizers, you can you know establish that uh, very quickly that it's a plus one eigen uh, eigen vector. But how about uh, some X type stabilizers? So now I act with some X type stabilizer on on my state. But then what what I have is I have S X prime S X sum over S X on all zero states. But now notice that um, you know this guy is. Um, just another X type uh, stabilizer operator. So uh, if I just change the summation index here to be SX double prime, uh, I just see that, you know, what this does, it sums over all possible uh, co uh, configurations. So it gives me uh, psi again. So, you know, once I have, uh, that's right, that's right. But then, uh, but then if I commute it through, I have this problem of, you know, what does X do on zero? It changes zeros to uh, ones. And then I, you know, I, I need to invoke this argument. This will just uh, reshuffle elements. Um, so, um, so I have this uh, first state in the code space. I can label it whatever you want. I can label it, for instance, um, to be um, my logical zero. And then I start, uh, I start, you know, building on it, right? I apply some non-trivial logical operator, uh, and uh, you know, I can find some state. In, I, I can apply some logical poly operator, logical x, uh, to get a logical one, and so on and so forth. And this this gives me the basis. Does this make sense? Yes. Uh, that's right. That's right. So uh, here. Uh, what I mean by that is this is the group generated by X type uh, generators. So it has all of them. So, you know, if I have K generators in this summation, there's two to the K terms, including the identity. Okay, so um, that's that's great. So um, we, we cover that. Um, are we building the toric code on a torus? Well, we need purely boundary conditions. So um, that's not that practical. So we're thinking about different realization of this, of this model. We can put it on a lattice with a boundary. And in particular, we can have uh, the full-on configuration. Just, just think of kind of um, cutting open the torus. So now I have a patch. Uh, this is toric code. Uh, on a square lattice uh, with boundary. So what, what's the modification here in the bulk? You know, nothing is modified, but along this line, I only have weight three plaquettes. Those plaquettes are kind of open. And along this edge, and then similarly along uh, this, this, this edge, uh, along this, this boundary, uh, I modify my X checks not to have this, uh, this edge. And because of, you know, did this boundary looks rough, it is usually referred to as a rough. And because this is smooth, you know, it's called smooth. Not very inventive, right? But uh, that, that's what it is. And you can convince yourself if you've never done it, this is your little homework, uh, that this guy has one logical qubit. Uh, and, you know, the calculation you do is, is the same, right? You just count the number of independent uh, Z checks independent X checks and subtracted from the number of uh, physical qubits. What are the uh, what are the logical operators here? Well, um, it turns out that uh, I can start with a string of Z's. I can create a single uh, electric charge along the rough boundary, right? Because now there is no other charge, and I can uh, move it, drag it through the system to the other uh, boundary where it will uh, condense, and this will implement logical Z. Uh, I can do the same thing with magnetic flux. I can create a single magnetic flux around the smooth boundary. I can drag it through the system, and this will implement uh, logical X. 
okay, and this this is more realistic to build because you know we just have a patch, a two-dimensional patch. We don't need purely bounded columns. Um, and here, let me just uh, make a little rant because people um, people uh, call this you know the surface code, or they may even consider a more qubit efficient version of it with the same distance, and they call it the rotated surface code. But you know, underneath, this is all just the toric code construction. It's just that the lattice that we pick changes. You know, there we have a torus uh, without, um, without a boundary, and we consider some tessellation of it. Here we have a disk, and we consider some tessellation of it, but we can have more handles. Uh, you know, we can consider different tessellations. The construction doesn't change. It's just the toric code. Oh, of course, you know, the toric code is also a bit unfortunate name and but you know calling it you know this is the toric code this is the surface code yet another thing is the rotated surface code makes little sense because you know would you call you know the IZ model on the square lattice differently than the IZ model on the square lattice with open boundary conditions versus closed boundary conditions or um or you know IZ model on the triangular lattice something else you know it's all the IZ model so it's just that the lattice changes so same with those constructions um, okay, so this brings me, uh, any questions here? All good? This brings me to, uh, to basically um, this point that, uh, you know, uh, we were talking about topological stabilizer codes. So, so what are they? Well, they are stabilizer codes, but now we consider uh, some manifold. So, we we have a torus or maybe um, you know some some other uh, manifold with two handles or some number of handles, and uh, what we need to do is we will place uh, qubits on this on this manifold, and we require that the density of qubits is finite. So we never pack uh, infinitely many qubits in any location, and then. Uh, this, is, this is what I defined by you know topological stabilizer codes. Uh, we have only uh, geometric local parity checks, and uh, we want that the distance uh, will grow uh, as the number of qubits grow. Okay, so um, this this is something uh, that 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 we want. And uh, this, this basically captures the torque code construction, you know, other models like the color. Yes? Uh, right, so by distance, I mean the um, quantum error correction distance. Uh, so uh, the distance just, you know, you know it, but I will say uh, the distance uh, of a code is the uh, weight of the uh, minimum weight uh, Pauli operator. So uh, in the Torah code picture, it corresponds to a uh, shortest non-contractible loop. Uh, that's right. Uh, so I, I, I uh, in terms of physical Paulis, yes. I ask about some uh, non-trivial logical Pauli, and I ask, you know, what is the minimum number of qubits I need to act on? Uh, so that I implement this operation on the logical level. As uh, n goes to infinity, uh, and the number of uh, physical qubits. Um, so uh, you want something that, um, um, you know, you can scale it up because, you know, you, you can consider a, a finer and finer uh, tessellation of your manifold and you want your code to provide you better, uh, better and better protection. That, that, that's right, uh, I can correct more errors. Uh, or, you know, the environment needs to act on more and more physical qubits. And this is a kind of uh, tying to what uh, Leo said uh, earlier, uh, which is, uh, okay, why don't I consider, you know, one copy and then another copy, another copy, another copy, you know, there, I would not, um, my distance would not grow because the distance would be fixed. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So 
if I have um, if I have um, a stabilizer code, uh, okay. So so one. Uh, let me tell you if I'm answering your question. The distance uh, of a code is defined as in the following way. I uh, consider uh, different uh, realizations of implementing a logical Pauli operator. So uh, does this make sense? Uh, yes. So I consider different uh, implementations of logical Pauli operators. So in the example of the Tor code, you know, I have this string of uh, x's implements logical x, but I can multiply it by some stabilizer. So it would, you know, it would wiggle. Or for instance, okay, maybe th this would be an illustrative example. I could consider a string of uh, z's that starts here, z, 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 Okay, so it basically wraps around the torus and goes like that. Um, you can uh, convince yourself that this is an operator that commutes with all checks and, and implements logical Z. Um, that's fine. So I can uh, count the number of qubits this operator acts non-trivially. So this would be the length of the loop, right? And now the distance asks about what's the minimal number of qubits that I need to uh, act on. So notice that in the Tori code, this loop is, you know, wiggles. So I can make this loop shorter by implementing, you know, instead of going this way, I can just go this way. And indeed those two physical uh, realizations of that operator are equivalent because they differ by um, those parity checks. If I multiply one operator by the checks within this enclosed region, I get that operator, right? So the distance asks, uh, distance tells me what are the shortest ones. Does this make sense? Um, so basically, you know, I can identify, so I can ask, um, so I have this Hamiltonian that is sum of all checks. Uh, I can say that there is an excitation uh, associated with a vertex V or with a phase F. If those, uh, those uh, terms, instead of giving me plus one, give me minus one. You know, there's some energy penalty uh, that I have to, uh, Pay and you know I have this this uh, this excitation sitting there, so uh, you know from from a quantum error correction perspective, you know having m just means that okay if I apply with uh, a single z, uh, sorry a single x uh, x guy here, the only stabilizer check that is violated is this z plaquette. But um, yeah, I just think of those, uh, you know, I, I just draw this analogy uh, kind of uh, pretty loosely. But like when we talk about decoding, it, it's useful to think of, you know, those um, checks that give me minus one as, um, as uh, locations of, um, of, of those excitations. And now the problem of recovery is, you know, how do I get rid of those excitations and get back to the uh, ground space? So this this brings me to the uh, to the question to, to my next topic, which is basically how to do decoding and what is what is what is decoding about. So maybe I'll just uh, get into that soon. But are there any other questions? We have a question about the rate of decoding. Yes, that's great. Yeah. You, you don't have like any restriction on it. If you if you increase increase the distance, you fade the rate. So that's right. So, that's right. that's that's great. So basically, you know, if we have topological, uh, if we have the toric code on a on a torus, you know, uh, the number of uh, logical qubits encoded there is twice the genus of the of the surface, and you know, genus is the number of handles. So uh, you know, if I have a torus and I just keep considering finer and finer tessellations, k stays the same. 
the number of qubits is, is larger, so the rate goes to zero. The distance grows, that's good. And uh, so basically K is constant and distance uh, scales as uh, root N. Yeah, and we would like this, you know, ideally we would like to, uh, for this to scale as N and for this to scale like N because it's possible. But then this, this will be the subject of the third lecture. We will have to remove certain limitations, certain assumptions that we made here. So we would not want our checks to be macroscopic. We will require that our checks are constant weight. So uh, low density parity check that that's you know low density that that's 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 what it captures our checks are constant weight uh, but what we have to abandon in order to get k that scales proportionally with n so that's the distance we will have to abandon the assumption that we made that the checks are geometrically local we can still place our qubits on a manifold but this is just for visualization purposes uh, but you know if we place them on some manifold then we we won't have geometric or local parity checks. Yes. Why can't I just punch an expensive number of holes in the? Um, yes, you can, uh, but uh, you will have more. Uh, you will have more uh, logical qubits. That's that's perfectly fine. But then the distance would scale still scale as you know root n. Uh, oh, I just. Um, I just thought of, you know, the square lattice, you know, the distance scales as the length of the shortest uh, loop. So the loop scales linearly with the system site, number of physical qubits scales, you know, as, as one uh, quadratically with the linear system sites. If you happen just to read the distance of get an order when uh, loop around that whole, right? Uh, that's right. So- It will um, scale it with n if whole. Um, yeah, but it will, well, so it will uh, be, you know, upper bounded by, um, it will uh, be upper bounded yeah. by uh, yeah. root n, yes. Just make a local and oh, and then if I make a local uh, hole, this, this will drop to a constant. Yeah. So I have to have big uh, holes, yes. Um, yes. It, well, it, there's, it, there's, uh, right. So, so, so the point is that um, you may have, um, yeah. So, so that's, um, you know, that's that's what non-trivial about proving thresholds. That indeed this this works. That if you have finite uh, error rate on each individual constituent, just by the sheer fact of scaling system up, you can suppress errors on the logical level to arbitrary low uh, level. Uh, given uh, you know the imperfections don't uh, go up if you scale the system up, which you know, yes, uh, this is basically you no know, because uh, I'm slowly transitioning to uh, the decoding problem, and we will talk about thresholds. Okay, yeah, but maybe yeah, a few more questions. Why is square root n not good? Um, it is good enough for all purposes, but you know, if we wanted you know uh, to have um, scaling with n, you know, linearly, you know, it could be better. Also, also notice, uh, right, I, I will address that uh, when I talk about thresholds. So what exactly is the topological Is it a map from a manifold to a sequence of stabilizer? So, um, so basically a, a topological stabilizer code, you know, I, I'm not giving you like an exact definition, but basically, uh, it's it's a stabilizer. So a, a topological stabilizer codes is you know, some uh, um, some cl uh, class of stabilizer codes which can be visualized by you know placing on a manifold and picking the um, 
set of checks and generating uh, sets to be local uh, checks in that in that geometry. And then I want like you know the distance to scale if I consider bigger and bigger system sizes. But in, indeed, you know, there's um, I'm, I'm kind of invoking you know the, the family of codes there too. Yeah. But you know, it's it's the same like uh, how would you define the Tor code, right? Uh, you have this this construction and you can apply it to any lattice. So uh, this is the spirit of 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 those topological stabilizer codes. I have some you know some some structure, some some lattice, and then I can you know no matter what the lattice is, I can I can define a code. The structure is uh, That's right. Those are the requirements about the party checks being local. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, well, it's it's a, a you know you can uh, you can calculate uh, genus for you know manifolds with boundary and you know it would be uh, or, or right you can um, it, it it would give you um, it would give you k equals one yes so you can puncture. Uh, you can have manifolds with boundary. Um, so you um, so the, um, you would basically ca uh, calculate the Euler characteristic of, of the of the manifold, and you know it relates to genus. So yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, and that's the but quantum that's LDPC codes. Yes, uh, because you know topological codes, I impose this extra structure that kind of stuff is you know on some uh, lattice. Uh, but you know if I get rid of it, that's you know quantum LDPC codes. You don't have to come to lecture number three because now you know what quantum LDPC codes. Are. Geometry is Say it again. Ge geometry is uh, well, it's not fictitious if you want to build. Yeah, yeah. That's right, but uh, why why do I care about this geometry too? Well, because as we will see, hopefully, you know, uh, in a minute, uh, this geometry helps us to find the recovery, helps us with the decoding problem for the Tor code. Okay, we have this structure which we leverage. Yes. So the distance, you know, there are many ways to define the distance. And for instance, um, if you ask, uh, you know, what is the minimal number of um, physical Pauli operators that I need to apply to map from one logical code word to another co logical code word, that, that gives you the distance. Yes. Right, so uh, I have it in my notes that, um, you know, maybe we should be calling them geometrically local. But you know, um, yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's right, that's right, that's right. And you know, think of the Hux uh, cubic code where the degeneracy does not depend only on the manifold. You know, we always have a three torus, but depending on the uh, length, uh, we can get different uh, different numbers of logical qubits. Right? I use the word rate. Oh yeah, rate. Uh, rate is the fraction. Uh, uh, it's a ratio of logical qubits to physical qubits. All good? Okay. So now uh, let's talk about the decoding.
So um, So I have my uh, toric cone, and now I have some errors. So there is some adversary that will implement uh, some uh, errors to my physical qubits. That's the setting. Uh, for simplicity, I will assume that the noise model is, 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 is fairly simple, is the Pauli noise model. So on every qubit, what can happen is that, you know, on, on this qubit, what I apply is, um, is the following channel, uh, either um, with probability P, and nothing happens, and then with probability PX, uh, X type error is applied, with probability PY, Y error is applied, and with probability PZ, Z error is applied. And you know, P is equal to PX plus PY plus PZ. This is, this is what is known as Pauli noise. Basically, what I imagine is that my environment, um, you know, roll, rolls a die or, you know, and generate some some you know to tosses a coin and you know uh, depending on the outcome um, either nothing happens to my qubit or Pauli X is applied or Pauli uh, Y is applied or Pauli Z is applied. This is known as the Pauli noise, and we can also uh, consider uh, simpler simpler realizations of Pauli noise. For instance, I can consider bit flip noise. And bit flip noise would for, for bit flip noise. I would set those probabilities to be zero. And what can happen is either nothing happens to a qubit or Pauli X is applied. Or, you know, similarly, uh, phase flip. Phase flip would be if I set, you know, those guys to zero and I have some uh, probability of having zero. Or I can have the polarizing channel. For the polarizing uh, channel, the polarizing noise, I would set all those guys to be the same. Okay, so those are like simplified noise models, uh, but you know they are uh, sufficient uh, for us to get to some you know interesting problems and interesting uh, challenges. So for simplicity, I will consider phase flip. I just have z errors in my system. And defacing would be z errors. Defacing would be z errors, like uh, that you apply z errors. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Um, what do you mean by defacing? A depolarizing. Depolarizing. So, uh, de yeah, depolarizing is that you know your state is replaced with some probability by the maximally mixed state. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, I can consider collations and stuff. Okay, so uh, phase flip. So I have the toric code now. Certain, uh, certain qubits are, are affected by my Z errors. Okay, so what, what's the problem here? So I had some code word that was, uh, by definition, plus one uh, eigenvector uh, of my stabilizers. This is what I started with. But now the environment applied Z errors at some locations. So now there is, you know, some um, Z error on my code word. So is this, is this state even uh, an eigenvector of my uh, parity checks? Is it? Who, who thinks that this is an eigenvector of my parity checks? Who doesn't? 
So okay, okay, okay. We don't have uh, we don't have a consensus here. Well, it is it is an eigenvector. It's just not the plus one eigenvector. And this is all about you know uh, error correction with with stabilizer codes is you know um, we will be in some um, other subspace where we have those plus and minus ones uh, specified by our error. And now we want to go back to the subspace where we have all plus ones. Does this make sense? Like on a very high level. Okay? So uh, how do we see that this is, uh, you know, so if I measure some, okay, so if I apply a Z check onto uh, this corrupted code word, you know, it commutes through because, you know, this is Z type, this is Z type. So I get back to the, uh, the same state. So indeed, this is plus one eigen, uh, eigen vector of Z checks, but for certain X checks, you know, this, this may or may not commute. So I will have this plus one, uh, plus one sign, but it will be an eigenvector. It's just, uh, you know, it may be minus one eigen. So in the Torx code, you know, what would that correspond to? Which are the parity checks that don't commute with this string? Mm -hmm. uh, those would be here. This guy, this x, 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 x does not commute because they overlap on this cube. And this guy, x, 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 x. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, well. Um, don't worry because I will not. I will be drawing pictures from now on. So <laughs> hopefully this will be simpler. So since you, uh, but you know, you don't have to look closely because all that matters is that there is there are those dots. You know, uh, this is this is the the Torah code decoding problem. I have some strings. There are some strings, and and so errors form some string like operators. You know. Mm -hmm. You know, they could be like here, or you know, they can form some closed loops, no matter uh, what they are, but I can interpret them as some string-like objects. And the signature, uh, the syndrome, the stabilizers, the party checks that give me minus one would be the endpoints of those string-like objects. So um, that is, that is a high-level uh, pictorial uh, representation of the problem. There are some Z errors that happened. All that I know about them is their endpoints. The first point, the first point, the SD check, would, the point there is you're not detecting the error. I, I don't, that's right, that's right. You would miss the error, but the RSS, so uh, That's right. So uh, notice that I, uh, restricted my attention to uh, face flips, Z errors. Uh, and for Z errors, Z checks are insensitive, but I have uh, I have X errors and X errors will be sensitive to uh, Z, uh, sorry, uh, X party checks will be sensitive to Z errors. And the problem of decoding would be analogous. It would be actually the same, but on the dual lattice. Okay, so uh, for, for that reason, we can just consider Z. Errors, okay. Um, uh, so, uh, but uh, all, all that I measure is generators, or you know, some maybe over a complete set. But I don't have to measure all of them. But you know, if I measure more of them, I can get robustness if certain measurement outcomes are flipped, because you know, um, I'm not talking about. Um, like a full-fledged fault tolerance setting. Here, I just assume, okay, I can measure this Pauli operator and it gives me the correct outcome. But in reality, we have to worry about that. And for that reason, we might uh, want to repeat measurement outcomes, or we can measure a set of party checks that is overcomplete to leverage the local redundancies. All good? Okay, so... Um, so what would be the what would be the decoding problem? You know, very pictorially, we have so 
So now I will not draw the lattice. I will just draw, you know, some strings. So this is some string of zeros, you know, like this. Okay. Um, yeah, but you know, the environment, you know, I, I'm a bad actor. You want to protect the Tor code state. I'm a bad actor. I implemented this, but you don't know that I implemented that. Right? So, uh, but you know, nothing stops me from implementing an operator that forms a closed loop. Uh, so I implemented this. What, what do you see? You just the endpoints. Is that um, good enough? Like fun? Okay. Um, and now the problem of decoding is to get back to the code space without implementing a logical operator. So um, on the more, more, more condensed Mary side, you know, you're, you have some excited state. You want to go back to the code space. How do you get back to the code space? You need to get rid of those excitations. So you have to, you know, move them and fuse them. You can uh, annihilate them uh, in a deterministic way. Um, and then you will be back in the ground space. The non-trivial part about this task is um, how do you do it without implementing some logical operation because you know uh, if 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 i'm very bad and i you know implement such a string of uh, errors you know you may be tempted to move them like that because they're nearby and uh, if you were to do it that way you know combine the error and your recovery would implement a logical operator and that's where, you know, decoding, and that's where our protection of logical information fails. Okay. So um, how, uh, how do we uh, do that then? Um, well, so since, since we're, um, okay. Um, what would you do? Okay, you know, how, how would you solve this problem? So what we can do is, um, we can do the following. So we see those point-like excitations. What we can do is, you know, okay, for each excitation, we may look in some neighborhood, in some small neighborhood, and see whether there's an excitation. If there is one, then we just bring them together and get rid of them. So, you know, for this guy in, in its uh, immediate neighborhood, there's nothing. But if I explore a slightly larger neighborhood, there would be another one. So I can choose, you know, I know how to move those excitations. I just need to apply a string like uh, uh, operator. And this is where I leverage the structure of the torque code. This, you know, such a strategy would not be applicable to any stabilizer code, right? Because if I see a violated parity check and I see some other violated parity check, I don't necessarily know that I can, you know, move the excitation from one side to the other side. And, you know, if you want uh, something to think of, think of the half cubic code, right? I have some excitation and it's, uh, and, and it's not, I, I may not have like a string like operator that moves it from one side to the other. This is where I leverage the structure of the torque. Um, so if I if I do it, then you know I I get rid of this pair, and uh, so here the, the situation is a little bit more complex uh, because okay, maybe let me do it this way. Initially, when I explore the neighborhood of each guy, there's no other excitation. But if I enlarge the neighborhood, I I get. Uh, I get basically, I, I cluster them like the three of them. And the three of them I cannot pair up because I need an even number of guys to pair up and remove. So uh, I need to start exploring larger and larger uh, regions. But basically what I'm uh, arguing in a very hand wavy way is this approach to the decoding known as renormalization group decoders or clustering decoders. 
So um, the intuition is for every excitation, on the, maybe not any intuition, it's, it's, it's the, the, the actual decoder. Uh, for every excitation, I explore its neighborhood. If uh, and then I uh, create a class, uh, I create a cluster of excitations. If they are in in the neighborhood of, of that excitation, and if this cluster has even number of guys, I can choose you know to move them to the same point, and they will all disappear because in the Torah code, you know, even number of excitations uh, fuses to vacuum. But here, you know, the example was that I had an odd number of guys, so I couldn't fuse them to vacuum. So in the next step, I need to explore a larger uh, cluster and so on and so forth. And this is basically the, the gist of the renormalization group decoder. So, but in practice, you one shot measure all the stabilizers for carrying the um, so um, in reality you've got to measure that uh, repeatedly because you cannot trust your measurement outcomes you, know you cannot trust your measurement outcomes and um, you know if i told you okay the code is tor code but this one was wrong you have an odd number an odd number will not fuse to to uh, vacuum so you um, you cannot get to the ground ground space. So um, but I guess I'm, I'm asking whether, like, suppose it's like, suppose your measurement stabilizes ideal. Ideal. Do you do this method, do uh, or do, do like the? One, do you like do one at a time, or can you just like in one shot get just a map? Oh yeah, yeah. Lines? You do it in one shot. You basically you so this this is shot. right. So uh, th those decoding algorithms and those those ideas is. A classical uh, algorithm that process those uh, bits of information that describe locations of your excitations. I do it on my cl classical computer, and then on my quantum computer, what I will do is I will just implement, you know, the correct recovery operator. It would be a Pauli operator, and it's like in one shot. Uh, but yes, that that does this answer your question. Mm -hmm. um, and no, because you know, in the Torah code, if I create an excitation, then I can move it and I pay no uh, energy penalty. Because you know, if I apply like, uh, um, right, if I apply, you know, because the string of errors, if I now, now extend this string, this one is no longer uh, unsatisfied, right? So all these are uh, of the same type error, right? It's all zero all x. That's right. We have to like make a make a full map like where M is, where E is. Then it that's right. Um, so uh, this this I don't have to worry about. This I don't have to worry about. I just I just um I just because um yeah uh, the, the short answer is I don't have to worry. I didn't, I didn't understand. For, for example, if I insert a uh, for example, if all these are E, if I insert mm -hmm. an M arrow somewhere, yes. Um, yes, but uh, but un, uh, but if I form closed loops, the loops will intersect uh, even number of times, and I will get uh, minus sign even number of times. So uh, there is no problem with uh, braiding statistics. Uh, so just just think of it that way. Uh, imagine I created a string of you know x's like this. Then your correction is that you paired it up like that. And now I I were you worry that okay there's a string of z's here for instance. And now I chose to correct it that way. Right. But notice that you know there's a loop of x's and the loop of z's, and they intersect even number of times. So I don't have to worry. Yes. Um, I'm not sure I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, so, 
that is that is that is a uh, that is a great comment, right? Uh, if I have you know some some uh, some configuration like that, uh, I don't have to worry about finding the exact locations of errors because the code is degenerate, right? Uh, there are many errors that give me the same syndrome configuration, but I don't care about which error created this syndrome configuration. All that uh, all uh, that matters is that I I find a pairing uh, like this, for instance, uh, that combined with my so this is my recovery. So error was like epsilon. This was this this, this string. Uh, my recovery is fine. All that uh, I care about is that they will form closed loops. Okay, this this that's all that matters, and I don't even have to pair them up correctly, like you know, uh, correctly, right? I can choose to pair them up like that, and we're still good. When will I not be good? Well, I will not be good if I did something like, you know, for instance, here. Here, right? Because now this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy will form an uncontrolled implement a logical operator failure. From condensed matter point of view, it feels like you could leave the deconfined phase and go to the confined phase. Then, you know, these strings now have tension. Mm -hmm. You could just Errors could just annihilate themselves. That's right. That's right. So, so you can have some, uh, you know. So, for instance, um, if I considered one type of error, I could consider the two D Ising model. Uh, there would be some energy penalty right. that I pay. It's going to be a parameter of of the region where I apply errors, and um, and this is the intuition why you know if we consider four D. Uh, Tori code that is kind of like a product of two eyes, uh, two D, two two D icing models. Right. We have this uh, tension for both types of errors, and that's kind of you know a, a very vague intuition why you know we have some uh, good uh, protection for the four D Tori code. We have self-correcting quantum memory. That's right. That's right. But even here, like somehow, like imagine you were in a confined phase. Right. Attention. That's right. The system itself. Right. So, so if you, if you could engineer a system where there is some sort of attention, you know, then you could have some, like, some protection. Let's say there's an error. You, I don't know. You can see how the problems would be because you would have to go through phase transition. Right. But let's say you, you, you know, there are errors that you have errors, then you. You act on the system to move it to the confined phase. Errors get annihilated, then you go back to the code. You know, go back to the right. System. I don't know. Yeah, but but you know, uh, what what kills us in the Tora code is if we create two uh, point like excitations, then they can start start to roam freely, and there is no energy penalty. So uh, from that perspective, you know, uh, this this is not a good memory. Right. If I were to yes. Because you don't, you correct against one type of error. But you know, but you could uh, engineer, and there were proposals where uh, you have, say, you know, the Tor code Hamiltonian, but you kind of engineer some interactions between. Uh, your excitations. So, but I am not like deeply familiar with it. But you know, you can uh, entertain an idea of you know having some sort of interaction. Um, I guess like the snapshot of where the endpoints are isn't necessarily like um, so. Um, in in actual realization of the Tori code, yes. Uh, but you know, here I don't worry about that. I just, you know, say I measure in a magical way party check operator, and it gives me the right answer always. Okay. Like, this strategy works here. Like it's better because now you know if you have a 
I yeah here, yeah. So that's that's a very nice question. Um, here, because okay, okay. How do I answer? This is this is a symmetry. This is a global Z two symmetry. Uh, what it means is that the if I have the toric code on the torus, the number of uh, excitations that I have is even, and I can do this pairing what we discussed over there. Here, I don't have this uh, global uh, Z2 symmetry, so to say. Uh, so the number of excitations that I have here may be odd. So now I have to allow, you know, this, this uh, you know, moving stuff around and fusing them, I have to allow for E to be fused to the boundary, to be condensed on the boundary. So, you know, I will have all those pairs of, so now what, what would I do? Like uh, in this RG decoder, if, I, if I'm in the bulk, you know, I do the same thing. I just look at the neighborhood. If there is something there, I kind of form like a cluster of excitations. If it's even, then I can just move it, annihilate it, remove it and move on. Uh, but if I'm near the boundary, you know, I explore the neighborhood, but if I hit the boundary, I choose to move it to the boundary because there it can die, you know? It can be condensed. Yeah. Um, so with this IG approach, how do you avoid that you get both non contact and even? Um, a priori, you, you don't know. So, uh, and this is this is uh, what uh, needs to be proven. I will not I will not prove it uh, for you, but uh, this is the non-trivial part about um, establishing that this strategy has a threshold. That this is this this needs to be proven because yeah. Um, so, but I I will start my lecture with next lecture with answering your question. <laughs> Um, no, no. So you can still have, um, you know, you have this cluster of excitations. You have odd number of them. You can choose, I don't know, the center of the cluster. You can move everyone there. And, uh, but you will still be left with one guy. So then, you know, but then uh, you got rid of all the excitations, you know, on, on, around it. So the next one is, is going to be farther and farther apart. So you've got to explore bigger and bigger um, neighborhoods. And at some point you may start to percolate. And if you percolate, you know, um, you can be, you, you've got to worry about basically what you were asking, which is how do you know that you're not implementing some non-contractable loop? Um, and that's, that's how you can show that uh, this has a threshold, meaning the probability of percolating if you uh, scale system up, uh, you know, goes to zero if if your uh, error rate is sufficiently small. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, right, but but you you uh, so um, you cannot uh, monitor the boundary. Uh, in a, in a realistic setting, because the operator that you would need to measure would be a product of uh, what is it? Z's here and Z's there, so together. So this would be a macroscopic uh, guy, and we don't want to measure parity checks that are not constant weight. But if you could, then you know, then uh, we would get extra information. We would get some redundancy. Okay, so um, so this is this is what is known in literature as RG clustering uh, clustering decoders. Um, they work, but they are not uh, they are not the best. And so basically, now I don't have that much time, um, but uh, I want to tell you, you know, what are the what is a better strategy. So in the next lecture, we will talk about the minimum weight perfect matching decoder uh, that finds the most likely error. 
uh, consistent with the observed syndrome. And we will also talk about the optimal decoder. And there uh, I will draw, um, draw an analogy or I will establish a, a connection to a statistical mechanical model uh, where, you know, depending on whether we're in an ordered or a disorder phase, this will tell us whether, you know, our code works or does not work. Any other questions? Um, let's see. I just have five minutes, but um, I'm not sure I want to start um, this formalism. Uh, but I can, well, I can start. Um, and okay, so maybe I'll start telling you about the minimum weight perfect matching decoder. And so High level intuition is, in, you know, this is, this is what you see. Yes. Yes. What's the idea of distance? Because a distance tells you that the environment has to corrupt at least that many qubits. So for instance, if your distance was, I don't know, one, it would mean that I can act only on one physical qubit and I will implement uh, a logical error. So you're very uh, prone to errors. And if the distance is larger, you know, and um, the adversary or the environment, you know, needs to act on many sites. That's, that's, or, you know, you can lose all those qubits, right? Because if I lose up to D minus one qubits, if they're just lost, I'm still good. The logical information is in my system. So, Okay, so what is minimum weight perfect matching um, decoder about? I see this configuration of errors and I have some noise model. Uh, namely, on my, uh, with probability uh, P, I have uh, zero and with probability one minus P, nothing happens, there's the identity. Right. So if I have some uh, configuration of, you know, Z errors that I denote by uh, epsilon, epsilon is just a subset of edges in my lattice. What's the probability of observing this type of an error? The probability of observing this type of an error is that. On those guys, I have to apply Z. So it's P to the power of the number of elements, you know, uh, the, the length of the string times. And on the rest, I've got to apply the identity operator. So one minus P, number of edges minus this epsilon, right? So it is, uh, I can take this one in front and then I have P one minus P to the power of P. So the probability of, of observing some error configuration, if my noise model is IID, meaning I apply phase flip errors uh, independently on each 
qubit with probability p, the probability of observing some configuration of any given configuration, like this, this configuration epsilon, uh, scales exponentially in the number of uh, locations where this error is supported, right? So log of this probability is just, you know, so this is some constant, so I can drop it. And this becomes, uh, and the, the size of this, the size of the error, error, the weight of the error times log P one minus P. I can also, you know, rewrite it as, you know, um, minus log one minus P over P. Now this is some uh, positive uh, value times the size of P. So what do I want to do? I want to find an error, which is the most likely error, right? So I want to optimize, I want to find error uh, such that uh, I want to find, uh, okay, so my recovery phi is defined as arg max over all possible errors consistent with the syndrome of this probability, right? I just want to find an error that is the most likely error. And how do I find it or what's the pictorial interpretation in the Tori code? Well, finding the maximum probability corresponds to finding the uh, maximum log probability. But this log probability is uh, finding max of, of this, this, this equality, but there's a minus sign here. So this corresponds to uh, minimizing this, 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 this quantity. So uh, pictorially, finding the most likely error in the Tori code it corresponds to finding the shortest um, shortest uh, pairing of my excitations. And that is the minimum weight perfect matching decoder and high level. I, can, I, I will get more into the detail uh, in the next lecture and, and I will introduce some formalism, but all that minimum weight perfect matching is about is fusing your excitations in a way that you know, the total path traveled by your excitations is the short. All right. Oh, I, I just, uh, so, so here I, I, I use this uh, notion very vaguely, right? It's, uh, you know, I can, I have some, uh, so I start with some state and I keep applying uh, the, this Pauli operator to get back to the ground space. But, but there's no like, Mm, dynamics per se. Right? I mean, I mean, I, I think about it that way, but like, yeah, it's it's a loser note. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. But here, I just have, and um, so here, I'm just thinking from the, you know, I have some classical algorithm, uh, and I talk about this classical algorithm that way. I'm not thinking about new excitations being introduced in the system. Because uh, indeed what you're asking is, you know, what is the big problem that we're solving about? And this is indeed the problem that we have to worry about. So we have a snapshot of the system. We do on a classical computer, some uh, processing of this information, you know, in order to get the recovery. But in the meantime, new, uh, new guys are introduced in the system. So you have to worry about them. So it gets more and more uh, complex. But here I'm considering the baby version of the problem. Okay, um, I guess unless there are some other pressing questions, um, let's get coffee, right? Okay, thanks a lot.